Hello, everyone, and thanks for coming along to the uh, Epicenter Public Seminar today. Uh, and uh, so today I'll be uh, talking about some recent projects I've been involved in and some current projects. And, uh, and specifically today I'll be uh, talking about four projects. Um, the first one is about a, a high temperature brushless motor. Uh, the second one is about an unusual type of permanent magnet motor. Uh, the third one, magnetic levitation for seismic isolation of buildings. And uh, finally, I'll talk about um, two e-bikes and the, uh, the brushless motors that are driving them. So to begin with, um, the first project that I've recently been involved in is ultra high temperature motor for the geothermal industry. And this work has been done for uh, uh, MB Century. And MB Century are a geothermal services company. They uh, are based in Wairaki, just north of uh, Taupo. And they provide geothermal services in New Zealand and internationally. So what they do, they'll, um, they'll maintain service uh, geothermal fields for uh, electric power generation. And they also uh, do the uh, do the drilling for um, uh, for new uh, for new geothermal bores. And I think recently, actually, they're also doing some of the electrical side of running the power stations as well. So, um, so the problem that they wanted to solve, um, just very quickly, I'll uh, I'll describe um, the basic components of the geothermal um, electric generation system. So you have the, uh, the geothermal field, which produces uh, uh, hot water at high temperature and pressure. Uh, that is tapped by a uh, bore, which uh, contains a, um, a, a pipe or casing, which is driven into the ground. Um, and then above ground, that, uh, that pressurized water is converted into steam. It goes through a turbine, uh, drives a generator, creates electricity. Uh, that steam is then recondensed and it's injected back into the well um, so that the well can, uh, uh, so that the fluid within the well can be sustained. Otherwise, if you don't reinject the water, eventually the, uh, the pressure and water levels in, in the geothermal field uh, start to decrease. So the, um, the problem is, is that um, the uh, the environment in which the casing, which is sunk down into the geothermal well, the pipe, which is sunk down, is a very, uh, is a very um, unfriendly environment for, um, uh, for metals. Uh, the fluid can be highly acidic or alkaline. Uh, the pressure can be up to 300 bar or 300 atmospheres. Um, the temperature can be in excess of 300 degrees C, and it's also um, can be very dirty and, and very muddy. Um, so this can lead to corrosion in the uh, in the casings uh, or build a positive. If a um, if a geothermal wall goes out of production, that would be very expensive for the uh, geothermal um, power station operator. So what they like to do is to um, periodically test the condition or inspect the condition of these casings. So to do this, uh, MB Century has developed a sophisticated tool which is deployed to periodically <coughs> monitor the casing condition. And um, this tool, it's, it's shown there, it's about three metres long and it has been developed entirely in New Zealand by MB Century and, uh, and a number of contractors, uh, including, including myself. I've been involved uh, with the uh, design building of, of a brushless permanent magnet motor, which is required inside the tool. So what this tool does, it, uh, it has an electromagnetic module, and that electromagnetic module, when you deploy this tool down into the well, it's... It, uh, it examines the, uh, the condition of the casing, uh, both the inside and outside of it electromagnetically, to give some indication of 
of, uh, of the state of the, of the casing. Uh, and it also has a second module uh, which contains in the array of, uh, of uh, fingers that you can see there. And what happens there is that those fingers are deployed inside the, uh, the casing of the well to actually feel the inside of the casing. So each finger feels the inside of the casing and if there's a hole, then the, then the finger will move up. Or if there's an obstruction, the finger will move down as the, as the tool passes through. And every movement of every finger is recorded electronically. Um, but the uh, but to uh, but once you put the tool uh, down the uh, down the hole, you then needs you have to have some way of uh, of um, deploying the fingers, opening them out, uh, because the uh, the tool is designed to fit in a variety of uh, of, of uh, casings of various diameters. So first of all, the uh, the fingers have to be deployed outwards and then the uh, measurements can be made. And then when that process is finished, the, uh, the fingers have to be retracted. And so an electric motor is required to do that, which is then connected to a gearing system, which then pulls the, pink, the fingers back in. And that actually requires quite a bit of force. Um, now, if, you, um, if you're unable to, uh, to, uh, to retract those fingers, then there's a chance that the tool could be uh, um, remain stuck in the, uh, in, in the bore and that would be a big problem. So on the left there is a, uh, is a better view of the, of the fingers of the tool and, and the space where they're retracted in once the, uh, once the measurements are complete. And on the uh, right there is, a, is, the, um, is the brushless motor that, that's being designed. Um, unfortunately, I'm, unable to, uh, I don't have permission to describe the, uh, the design and the details of the motor, but I can talk about some of the challenges involved in, the, in, in, its, in its specification. Um, standard insulating materials and adhesives are largely ruled out above 300 degrees C. This motor it has uh, it has been it's been designed to operate in ambient temperature of 320 degrees c so that's well above the uh, uh the temperature which um, normal organic materials can uh, can cope with and um other issues were that the coefficients of thermal expansion of motor of the motor components uh, had to be carefully considered uh, given the uh the great temperature rise that can occur as the um, as the motor is deployed and goes from room temperature up to 300 degrees, or possibly even further. Um, and it also the design of the motor also required the identification and procurement of uh, special materials from around the world, and some of those materials were quite uh, quite exotic. And the motors were um, designed, constructed, and tested at UC and uh, have been delivered to the client and the uh, casing condition tool and the motor have now been deployed successfully uh, at geothermal sites overseas. Um, and just briefly, uh, this, is a, this is a picture of the, of the load test bed setup that I um, put together to do the load testing of the motor at, at uh, room temperature before it was all sent off to the client to do the, uh, the high temperature testing. So just here, uh, the motor here is, is connected to a, a reaction torque sensor here. The reaction torque sensor measures the torque, the counter torque transferred through the casing of the motor. Um, that's quite useful because the torque sensor doesn't have any moving parts. Um, it's useful for measuring the average torque which the motor produces. It's not so useful for measuring the instantaneous torque at the shaft because, because it's a reaction torque that's been measured through the casing, the uh, rotational inertia of the casing damps out that, uh, that pulsating torque. 
but still it's very useful for, for load testing to calculate efficiency and other characteristics. And at the other end of this load test bed is the, is the load, which is an eddy current break, and the magnitude of the load is, is, is controlled by these um, DC electromagnets. Um, on the other side here is the, that's the electronic controller driving the motor. Uh, it's a three-phase power meter there. And the, um, and the various setup parameters for the uh, motor controller are, um, are, um, are dialed in using, this, uh, using the PC. Uh, the, uh, the next project uh, I've been involved in is um, it's about a, a, an unusual uh, type of single phase synchronous permanent magnet motor. So this is a, this is a class of single phase motor but it's synchronous rather than the commonly used synchronous of single phase induction motor. This is synchronous, so it's a little bit more unusual. And this particular motor that I've developed is being licensed to and currently being commercialized by an electric motor manufacturer. Um, so just introducing the conventional form of this type of, of single phase motor, it has a very simple construction. It basically, it's a stack of U-shaped laminations. Um, and on those laminations are, um, are positioned um, uh, bobbins containing windings. These bobbins can easily be uh, pre-wound before they're inserted into the uh, U-shaped lamination. And you have, a, you have a permanent magnet motor, sorry, permanent magnet rotor made out of a hard ferrite material. And you have an asymmetry in the air gap. And what that does is it lines up the, um, the magnetization, uh, the poles of the permanent magnet rotor uh, with the portions of this air gap where the air gap is minimized. And what that does is it allows you to, uh, allows the motor to um, come to a startable position when it's turned off. Um, these motors are uh, typically used in small domestic appliances. Um, um, you probably come across them in shavers in particular and, and also the widespread in, in uh, washing machine pumps and dishwashers and things like that and, uh, and uh, clothes washers. Um, and these, uh, these particular motors, they, they uh, emerged in the, they became available in the 1960s as a result of the development of, uh, of that hard ferrite permanent magnet material, which, uh, which, which, was, uh, which had a high enough coercivity um, to resist being demagnetized by the, by the currents and the windings. Up till then, this type of motor wasn't really possible. So the advantages are a very uh, simple, low cost construction, um, high power per unit volume, high reliability and low electromagnetic noise. There are no, no brushes, so you don't get that type of electromagnetic noise. Um, high efficiency due to the permanent magnet excitation, and also they operate at synchronous speeds. So if they're uh, connected to the mains, uh, they're very good at timekeeping because they uh, operate at the, uh, at the frequency of the grid. Um, this velocity plot here uh, gives some insight into what they do when they start. When, it, uh, when the motor initially starts, it sort of uh, spends a little bit of time working out which way it wants to spin. And then suddenly it decides it wants to spin in one particular direction and it will accelerate to synchronous uh, speed within half an electrical cycle. But typically this acceleration period here it's about six milliseconds, so over six milliseconds, it accelerates from zero RPM to 3,000 RPM, so it's quite an acceleration. And then it uh, goes through a transient and eventually, uh, eventually settles down into steady state synchronous operation. Um, so obviously, to be able to accelerate that quickly in order to synchronize, uh, the moment of inertia and the rotor and the load must be low enough to allow that synchronization to occur. And this obviously places a, uh, a restriction, a, quite a severe restriction on the, on the rotor diameter and the, and the power rate. And so that's why these motors are, are very small. And also there is no control over the final direction of rotation. And um, 
and the frictional torque uh, and the, the load torque must be low enough such that the rotor can come to rest at a startable position, uh, as, I, um, as I mentioned before. And it can be difficult to design a stable running motor and loads with uh, velocity dependent damping are most suitable. Say for a water pump, the, the load is a quadratic function of speed, so that provides quite good uh, damping. And uh, the twice electrical frequency uh, torque pulsation can cause vibration and uh, noise problems. So here are a couple of, um, of uh, top topologies. Um, uh, this one on the left here, um, the stator slots are closed. They have what's called saturation bridges. And this motor, this is the permanent magnet rotor here, and this motor is put together by, um, by threading these, inserting these pre-wound bobbins onto the stator yoke here. And then once they're inserted, you then insert this yoke plug uh, so that allows a, uh, a simple form of constructing the motor. Uh, this other uh, topology, this has open slots, open air gap slots. And the, uh, the windings um, are not so easily inserted. They um, you need to be uh, wound into the, uh, into the stator slots there. So, what the, uh, the motor that I've developed does is that it applies a technique for smoothing the pulsating torque. So I'll just explain how the pulsating torque occurs. So as this permanent magnet rotor rotates, it has a, creates a magnetic, permanent magnetic flux, which will link, follow a path around here and link these stator coils. And as the rotor spins, that will induce a voltage or a back EMF in these stator coils. Now, if you uh, take that instantaneous back EMF and you divide it by the angular speed of the motor, then you get this quantity here, which I've called the EMF torque function. And in this case, it's actually a perfect or near perfect sinusoid uh, when the motor is operating in, in, in closed circuit. And then if you apply a sinusoidal current to the windings of the motor in phase with this EMF torque function, then you get a sine function multiplied by a sine function, producing a sine squared function. The product of the two is the instantaneous torque. So then as a result, you get this, what I've called this mutual torque, which is a sine squared function occurring over, over one electrical cycle. And as you can see here, it has, it, it creates, um, a torque pulsation, and if the motor is operating at 50 hertz, this is this is uh, this uh, causes a 100 hertz torque pulsation, and that is a characteristic uh, torque pulsation found in all sorts of single phase motors, whether they are whether they are synchronous like this or, or induction, and various techniques can be applied to reduce that, but. The technique applied here to, uh, to reduce that torque pulsation is that if we, uh, this sine squared torque pulsation, we can resolve it into a DC component here plus an alternating AC component. Now, if you provide a counter torque, which is an antiphase to that alternating torque component, then you can cancel it out and then you're just left with this DC component. Um, so the, alter the, the alternating torque component, which is in opposition, is provided by the reluctance torque of the motor, the permanent magnet reluctance torque. Now, permanent magnet reluctance torque 
well, it's kind of, uh, if you've got a fridge magnet and you pull it off the fridge, you, you're feeling a permanent magnet reluctance force. So that's the type of force it is, and it's always present regardless of whether the, uh, whether the motor is energized. And what we do here with this motor is that we design uh, this air gap, which the rotor is in, um, to produce this torque, to produce required amplitude and also phase of this reluctance torque by altering the orientation of this air gap. Um, so the amplitude of this reluctance torque is designed to be equal to the rated torque of the motor, which uh, is equal to this constant torque here. So at rated load, in theory, the torque pulsation of the motor disappears. And as, you, as the load departs from that nominal load point, if it gets greater or smaller, then torque pulsation starts to occur, but there is a, a sweet spot within a range of that nominal torque where the torque pulsation is significantly uh, reduced. So over here is a, an experimental motor that was built to, uh, to test the concept. And uh, I've got uh, one on the bench, just here. I've got that just here on the bench if you're curious to have a look at it at the end. Um, this slide uh, describes the, uh, the load setup which was used to, to test the motor. So uh, here's the motor here. And on the left is, the, uh, is an eddy current brake which, uh, which acts as the, as the load for the uh, motor. And by adjusting the height of these bridges, you can vary the, the magnitude of the, uh, of the load created by the city current disk and it has permanent magnets on either side of it to provide the field across the magnetic field across the city current disk. On the other side of the motor, we've just got a, uh, a little disk attached here and you can see just here there is the, um, there is a little red dot produced by a laser, not, not as well as the laser that I'm showing you there. Now, the, um, that is produced by this device here on the right which is a laser Doppler anemometer. And that was used to measure the instantaneous speed of the shaft. And the reason that was used is because the laser anemometer doesn't add any more rotational inertia to the, uh, to the motor because the motor was started as a line start motor. So it was, uh, it was started with a 50 Hertz uh, supply and it, uh, started, uh, so 50 hertz um, power, it was energized with a 50 hertz power supply and it uh, synchronized instantaneously uh, within the first half electrical cycle to synchronous speed. So that the, um, so in order to do that, the, um, the rotational inertia that you could attach to the motor was severely limited. So using the laser Doppler ammometer uh, enabled the, uh, the amount of uh, inertia connected to the shaft to be, uh, to be minimized. So some results here, the uh, um, for forward rotation at the nominal load, um, uh, this shows the uh, rotor speed uh, from the, uh, um, this, uh, this line here is zero RPM and uh, here we're at 3000 RPM. So as you can see, the, um, uh, the uh, speed uh, only has a very small uh, speed uh, modulation, so the uh, so the um, most of the uh, nearly all of the torque uh, torque pulsation has been uh, has been smoothed out. Um, and to show how that um, how that contrasts, if the motor is op is spinning in the opposite direction, the um, that permanent magnet reluctance torque instead of cancelling out the pulsating torque, it actually acts in phase with that pulsating torque to actually enhance it. So uh, in this case, there is uh, quite a significant uh, uh, speed modulation, and this is um, very typical of, uh, of motors of this type, which don't, have, which don't apply this, smooth, this torque smoothing capability.
Um, and just down here are the, uh, the, uh, the current waveforms are plotted. As you can see here, at uh, near zero current, the, um, the current's quite pinched. That's caused by the, um, by the uh, at low current, it's caused by the, uh, by the, um, the saturating bridges, which I showed you earlier, um, becoming unsaturated because there's very little current in the windings. And that causes the inductance of the windings to dramatically shoot up, which tends to pinch the currents. So that causes the uh, distortion in the, uh, the otherwise sine, sine wave shape you'd have in the, in the current waveform. Now the, uh, the theory and results um, describing this motor are, uh, are shown in this paper. Um, this paper was um, published some time ago, back in 2005. And uh, it, um, it was um, uh, published in the Electric Power, um, Electric Power Applications Journal, uh, which um, is published by the, by the Institution of Engineering and Technology. And um, this paper was also awarded um, a premium award by the, uh, by the institution, which is a pest which is the best paper award for the um, for a paper um, submitted to that journal for that year. So um, recent, uh, so jumping forward a few years until uh, until recently, um, uh, one of these motors uh, has been custom designed for an electric motor manufacturer's application. Unfortunately. I can't show you the design, the design of this motor and, and I can't tell you who the manufacturer is and I can't tell you what the application is. <laughs> Very secret. So uh, the motor manufacturer, but I can say that the motor manufacturer has developed a senseless single phase inverter base controller for the motor. So this single phase inverter that they have developed um, <coughs> That allows the motor to then be operated as a, as a variable speed drive instead of fixed speed. And also importantly, uh, by using, being able to use a single phase inverter controller, the, um, the rotational inertia constraint is, uh, is removed. So you can then make the motor a lot bigger or you can um, drive loads which have uh, a far greater moment of inertia. So, uh, so this motor drive has now been successfully prototyped and has been evaluated by the manufacturer's customers. Right, the next project uh, is entitled Towards the Ultimate Earthquake Proof Building, Magnetic Levitation System for Seismic Isolation of Buildings. Now, the idea for this project was proposed by uh, Professor Stefano Pampanen uh, when he was at the, in the Civil Engineering Department uh, here at UC. Um, and he understood that the, the ultimate or perfect way of uh, isolating an a building during an earthquake was to remove any physical connection uh, between the building and the ground. So in that case, the ground could shake as much as it wanted to, uh, but none of that shaking would be transferred to the building. So Stefano was curious to know whether it was technically feasible and economically feasible to achieve this ultimate or perfect base isolation uh, using magnetic levitation. So the purpose of this project has been to examine that, to see if it's possible or if it's just a crazy idea. Um, so this slide shows uh, the Earth's tectonic plates and it also shows uh, um, 
locations of earthquakes around the world. And obviously, as you can see, there, there are big concentrations of, of earthquakes where there are plenty of people. So it's a, uh, a problem which affects not just us, but people all around, all around the world. And it can also create a lot of damage and, and also uh, take, uh, take lives. Uh, as an example, uh, the February, uh, February 2011 Canterbury earthquake, uh, the cost of this damage has been estimated as being New Zealand $40 billion, um, which amounts to about 20, 25% of New Zealand's GDP. Uh, so that is a, a tremendous uh, amount of, of money. And so what are the uh, current technologies used for base isolation? Um, why is, to begin with, why is uh, base isolation used? Well, if you have a fixed base, and then you get an earthquake, then the structure is going to sway with the, or move with the, uh, the ground movement, and, and that could cause uh, uh, structural failure. Um, but if you isolate the building with a, a base isolation bearing as shown here, then a certain amount of that, uh, of that movement is not transferred to the structure. Um, and the state-of-the-art techniques which are used are mechanical techniques, particularly the lead rubber bearing, uh, which has, uh, uses layers of, uh, of rubber and steel and also contains lead to, uh, to absorb that earthquake energy and also to provide that flexibility in, in some isolation. Another, another technique is to basically use a, uh, a bearing uh, which the building sits on, the, the base of the uh, building sits on, and when the earthquake occurs, uh, this can move in this cavity. So these are mechanical solutions. Um, and in all these mechanical solutions, the building remains connected to the ground and, and still transfers part of the ground shaking to the, uh, to the building structure. Um, the problem with this is that even with these base isolation systems, there will still be resonant frequencies uh, of the building in the base isolation system that you cannot eliminate. And if the excitation frequencies of the earthquake happen to match that, then you're going to have, uh, you're going to reach resonant points and that can still create damage. Um, but the problem is it's very hard to, to try and uh, estimate what the excitation frequencies of the earthquake are going to be and predict how you should design that building using the conventional base isolation. Um, so that actual problem um, caused um, unexpected damage at the um, Christchurch Women's Hospital. So can we get things off the ground with magnetic levitation? Um, so the idea, as I said, is to use magnetic force to 100% decouple the building for perfect uh, structural isolation. Um, uh, this is an example here of magnetic levitation using, uh, using superconductors. Uh, what we've got here, we've got a bulk superconductor, um, which has been cryogenically cooled in a bath of liquid nitrogen, and, um, and there is a permanent magnet suspended above it. Uh, that, that occurs because the superinductor is diamagnetic and it repels the, uh, the magnetic field of the permanent magnet, uh, which, which um, creates a stable uh, uh, levitation system. And over here, we, um, we have a levitating frog. And that frog is levitating at the top of a superconducting electromagnet in a field of about 16 teslas, which is a very high field. And the reason why that frog is able to levitate, it's a live frog, um, is because the frog contains water and water is slightly diamagnetic. And so the magnetic field is strong enough to produce sufficient force 
to stably levitate the frog. Now, if the superconducting electromagnet was big enough, then you could also do the same thing to a human being uh, because we, we contain similar amounts of water to a, uh, to a frog. It, um, but what we wanted to do with this project was to see if magnetic levitation of a building could be achieved technically and economically without having to use superconductors because superconductors are very expensive, they're very difficult, and if they're not cryogenically cooled, then, then the um, system doesn't work. So this example is, is an example of one of the, um, uh, one of the configurations, one of the uh, types of, um, of magnetic levitation that, um, that I've looked at. This is a suspension system, and in a suspension system, um, the, uh, we have an electromagnet underneath, which is this ring here. Um, it contains a, um, a, an aluminium winding here. And when, when current is driven through this winding, uh, it creates um, magnetic poles, electromagnetic poles, which attract this upper plate to the lower plate. So in this case, this upper plate here is connected to the ground, to the foundation, and this electromagnet, which is suspended below it and which is attracting itself to the upper plate, this electromagnet is connected to a column of the building which goes through this hole in the centre. Now, the reason why the electromagnet is suspended is because it weighs less than this reluctance plate above it. Um, in this particular example, the, um, this electromagnet is designed uh, to lift 100, 101 tonnes. Um, it has a lift to weight ratio of 20, so that's, that's useful. Um, it has a steady state winding loss of five kilowatts, and this is, there is a five millimeter air gap between the plate and the electromagnet. Now, if you, if you, if it was, if you needed to increase the electromagnet's height, the, the, the air gap separation to say 10 millimeters, then you'd need to uh, double the current, which would quadruple the losses. So the steady state loss in the winding, the, in the winding would then, would then rise to uh, 20 kilowatts. Um, but then you, you might look at, an, at another design. Um, another aspect of this design is that what's particularly challenging um, um, for designing a magnetic bearing for an earthquake um, is that unlike a train, unlike a levitating train, maglev train, uh, you have to you have to allow for um, you have to allow for uh, movement in a horizontal plane, say up to uh, half a metre in any radial direction. And this device, um, this device uh, enables relative uh, movement between the two components. Um, so if the, um, if the reluctance plate here, which is connected to the ground, moves, say, uh, this distance here is half a metre, for example, moves half a metre in this direction to the right, um, then the, um, the electromagnet uh, is still in contact with the plate, and so the attractive force uh, is maintained over the full range of uh, displacements that, uh, that uh, are expected to occur. Um, it is a very uh, challenging uh, problem. On top of this, then you need to look at the uh, control aspects. Um, the idea in this case is when the when the earthquake is detected, then the then the electromagnets are uh, are energized, and the and the electromagnet lifts off the ground, lifting the building up. Um, and you need a uh, you need a power supply such as a bank of batteries and. Uh, uh, and you also need uh, power electronic systems converters to, uh, to control the uh, air gap separation uh, to maintain that between the, the two plates. And also um, you need to uh, deal with other things such as, uh, well, uh, it's really a problem of controlling uh, six degrees of freedom. You've got, 
you've got uh, you've got linear movements in three in three directions x y and z and you've also got uh, um, three degrees of uh, rotational uh, movement to control as well so um, this is a this is an on, uh, ongoing uh, investigation do I have a <laughs> no, no, but if, uh, if if we had a big enough superconducting electromagnet, we could probably let you jump on it. <laughs> uh, and so finally, uh, my last uh, my last project, I'm going to uh, describe two e-bikes and also describe the brushless motors which uh, drive these bikes. Uh, so the first one is the Ubco utility bike. Now, Ubco is a New Zealand company and they're based in Tauranga. And <coughs> their bike is an all-wheel drive bike. So there is a brushless electric motor in, uh, in both hubs. So that makes it very useful for, uh, for off-road operation, particularly for farmers going up uh, for... Um, farming operations and just uh, uh, going into uh, places where uh, a lot of traction is required. So this is a uh, this is a picture of the uh, brushless motor uh, which drives the uh, the Ubco bike, and I've got the Ubco motor here. If you if you're curious to have a look at it at the end of the talk, um, this design. It's, it's what's called an outer rotor design where the rotor uh, sits outside the stator and the rotor contains this uh, array of permanent magnets. Um, this type of motor is particularly good for several reasons. Um, one of them is to do um, with the uh, combination of stator slots and rotor poles. So there's 36 stator slots and there's 32 permanent magnet poles, and um, they produce. They are equivalent to a uh, to a ratio of uh, nine um, nine stator slots uh, to eight poles. So. This is what is called a fractional slot brushless motor as opposed to an integral slot brushless motor, which is something that you, you may be more familiar with. And one of the advantages of using a fractional slot design like this is that it can produce, it can reduce the amount of cogging torque which the motor produces. Now cogging torque is that torque you feel when you when you twist the shaft of a brushless permanent magnet motor when it's not energized, and ideally uh, that that can be quite a, a powerful torque, uh, and it's really a parasitic torque that you want to get rid of so that so that the shaft can be turned smoothly. Ideally, um, with this slot pole combination, the uh, cogging torque frequency is given by the lowest common multiple of the slots and the permanent magnet poles. So with a nine slot, eight pole motor, the lowest common multiple is 72. And what happens in this motor is that that eight slot, nine pole sequence is repeated four times around the motor. And so therefore the number of the cogging frequency or the number of cogging torque cycles uh, are 288 cycles per revolution for this motor. Now, the higher the cogging torque frequency, the lower the cogging torque is. So that is one advantage of this particular design. Another advantage of this particular slot pole combination is that it's produced what's, it produces a winding factor, um, which is very high, which is uh, um, particularly high for a brushless uh, motor. And the significance of the winding factor is that the, uh, the torque which the motor produces is proportional to this winding factor. 
And the third advantage of a fractional slot motor like this is that the, the, what's called the end turns of the motor are very short. So the end turns are what you can see there. They basically just wrap around a single stator tooth and they don't have to traverse several stator teeth. And by being able to, um, to reduce, to minimize the end turns to just one slot pitch from here to here, you end up reducing the amount of copper in your end windings and that in turn reduces the amount of uh, losses in, in your winding. So just uh, talking about the uh, the nine the nine uh, the nine slot eight pole uh, motor in general. Um, uh, this diagram here shows a motor where we've, where the uh, the rotor is back inside uh, the stator, and the um, uh, the stator has nine slots and there's eight poles on the rotor. Um, this particular case, there are three coils per phase and there's three phases in the motor. And as you can see here, so the, the next set of phases go here to here to here to here, and then the third phase will go from here to here to here to here. So as you can see here, this, this, these three coils which make up the first phase winding, they are not repeated diametrically opposite on this other side. So what that causes is a magnetic asymmetry where the magnetic forces are not balanced across the motor. So this is not ideal, but with the case of the, uh, of the subco motor I've just showed you, that sequence repeats four times around mechanically around around the periphery of the motor. So that does have electromagnetic balance diametrically across the motor. Um, this 9.8 slot to pole motor is uh, very well known and quite famously used in hard disk drives. Now, the reason it's used in hard disk drives is because that lowest common multiple that I discussed before uh, 72 is high, which results in a low, the low cogging torque, which I, uh, which I mentioned earlier. In hard disk drives, it's very important for the hard disk drive to have very low cogging torque because you want the, uh, the torque uh, to be as smooth as possible so that you don't, uh, you don't get problems reading the data off the hard disk. Um, um, so that's why that has been prepared, been, sorry, preferred in hard disk drive motors. And uh, so what they've, and so in hard disk drive motors, they have uh, accepted having that asymmetry um, and just made sure that the, the place, that the rotor is placed very accurately um, in the center of the, um, of the motor because uh, with motors with these electromagnetic symmetries, they're very sensitive to eccentricity. Um, and just getting back to um, the winding factor for this type of motor, and this winding factor applies to the Abco motor I've described in the other slide. As I said, the winding factor is very, is very high in this particular case. The ideal winding factor is, is one, is unity, but in this case it's, it's 0.945, which is very high. And if you're designing a motor to be, op, to be run as a sine wave motor with a sine wave controller, then what you want is the motor to produce a sinusoidal back EMF. And in that case, what you want is that, is you want the fundamental to be as high as possible. So in this case here, the, um, the winding factor which, um, of, of the fundamental is, is very high, 0.945, as, as you can see here. Um, it, it produces a, um, quite a high third harmonic, but this third harmonic is completely eliminated by uh, connecting the three phase windings and start. And uh, that also has the effect of, um, 
of eliminating all harmonics which are a multiple of three of the thirds. So that also uh, that also gets rid of uh, uh, will also get rid of um, the the fifteenth and the twenty first harmonics there. Um, so ideally, um, for the sine wave driven motor, you want all the rest of the harmonics to be as close to zero, except for the fundamental. So as I said, this third harmonic gets eliminated by how you connect the windings and star. Um, the fifth and seventh uh, harmonics remain pleasant, uh, pleasant uh, sorry, present. The 11th uh, and 13th still stay there. The 17th and the 19th still stay there, but they are higher order harmonics. And they will produce, uh, when you energize the motor, they will contribute to producing uh, torque ripple, but that torque ripple will be at a, at, at the, uh, at, at a relatively high order, at the order of these two harmonics, um, which will tend to have less impact on the torque quality of the motor. But, um, but in summary, um, this, um, this, this fractional slot, 9-8 slot fractional slot motor, that uh, Abco are using uh, is, is a very uh, good uh, design magnetically and, and also um, and also in some res and mechanically as well. Um, Zero Motorcycles is an American company uh, which produces uh, electric road bikes and uh, it's their their bikes are chain driven and they have a uh, they have the, they have an electric motor and batteries in the in the body of the uh, of the bike and uh, this is the uh, this is the electric motor that uh, Zero uses and this motor um, unlike is different from the Abco motor this motor um, to start with the the rotor is an interior rotor uh, which goes inside the stator and also the um, the permanent magnets are buried inside these rotor laminations so, so these are the uh, these are the uh, rotor magnets here permanent magnets and they um, create 10 poles um, and there are um, 12 poles on the stator. So this is also a fractional slot motor um, and the ratio of the ratio of uh, slots to poles is 1.2. So this motor also has some of the advantages that, uh, that the UBCO design has in that, um, that the end turns are minimized because the um, uh, the, uh, the interns only span one uh, one pole pitch, and the um, and also the um, for this uh, 1.2 slots of pole topology, the uh, the winding factor is also very high. And as I said, the, the higher the winding factor, the more torque you get, or the better efficiency. And the other and the, but the major difference here, perhaps with the um, with the zero motor, is that because these magnets are buried within the stator, um, and it's called an interior permanent magnet motor in this case, that the that the inductance of the windings is is boosted significantly, and also because because there is magnetic symmetry in these iron laminations of the rotor, you get. A second type of torque occurring as well, a um, sort of an inductive reluctance torque, which is proportional to the uh, current driving, which is a function rather of the current driving the motor. So there are now two torques occurring, but one of the advantages of, of having more inductance in your stator is that it enables you to, uh, uh, to better be able to do something which is called field weakening. So this slide here describes what field weakening, well, why, why you want field weakening. So in a, um, so in a, in a uh, e-bike, particularly say a road bike, it's advantageous to be able to 
extend the speed range of the motor as, as much as possible. So typically with brushless motors, you'll have, uh, you, you'll have a, a region, a first region where the motor can provide maximum constant torque up to a certain speed here. But then beyond that speed, it can no longer deliver constant torque and the torque uh, begins to reduce um, until finally we get to a, um, a maximum speed. Now in this second region here, the product of this decreasing torque and the speed is constant power. So as we can see here in this first portion, the torque ramps up and so does the power. And then in the second region, we have uh, constant power. And then obviously in, a, in an e-bike, in a road bike in particular, you want this speed region here to be extended as, sorry, as, as far as you can. <laughs> and so one way of being able to extend the speed range is to apply what's called field weakening, um, which, which effectively you use, the, uh, you use the inductance of the motor to counter the, the back EMF or internal voltage created due to the permanent magnets. So, um, so in this particular case, in this uh, phaser diagram here, um, you have the back EMF here, which is proportional to the speed of the, uh, of the motor. And here you have the terminal voltage of the motor. And in this particular case, the, motor, uh, the machine is able to motor at a speed where the back EMF within the motor is greater than the applied voltage, yet you can still drive current into the motor. And the reason for that is because the component of the, uh, of the reactive voltage due to the inductance is opposing here as an anti-parallel to this back EMF. And so that enables you to increase your, uh, your constant speed range further. And uh, that wraps up the CPI Center uh, public seminar. So uh, thank you for coming. Uh, Roger, what? Yes. Um, what, is there any advantage of going three phase then? Because I don't have trouble with having a controller. Is it actually nicer to go three phase? Um, yeah, well, that's, that's a very good question. And the, um, the motor manufacturer has weighed up these various factors including the motor and its construction and the uh, and the uh, the cost of the power electronics and they've come to the conclusion that using the single phase motor is an economic solution for them otherwise like you've said they'd, they'd use a three phase inverter and have a three phase motor which yes. doesn't have any torque pulsation issues. Um, I, um, I uh, no, I haven't. Though I, I have been with another manufacturer there that, that I won't divulge. <laughs> <laughs> Because with the same motor, actually, um, the traditional ones at that moment, you can do the same correction to go in. So I guess the single pay for it, you always have that one. Um, are you sure about the direction of the motor to go in? Yes, you can, because you can, uh, um, you, can, you can use techniques to determine what the rotor position is. Um, um, for example, you can uh, you, you can look at the uh, look at the inductance in that particular rotor position to determine uh, where it is. So yes, yes, you can you can control for that. Yeah. 
Now coming to the um, new building limitation. Um, here is the traditional yes, my eyes. Yeah. What if yeah. you instead of trying to levitate the bridge of some electromagnetic devices to actively damp or accelerate the building with the traditional technology? So, using better process, traditional technology plus active, some kind of activity. Well, um, yes, well, Roger, you might be reading my mind. Um, <laughs> we, 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 we have been looking at that, and, and I, um, I have designed such a device. Yeah. So, um, the key word to me was really the second law resonances that cause problems. It's much smaller problem to start with. Um, yes, and, and you're not you're not dealing with the problem of levitation in that case. That's that's a major issue uh, removed. Yeah. Um, well, I, well, I, well, I think the uh, the highest accelerations were were in Heathcote Valley, and they 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 were over over one. Yeah, yeah, so You're in the vertical. I see the magnetic thing being great. Let's take some margin. Move a bit before it hits you. Um, but those, those, um, curiously, those, uh, those occur on a on a very, very short time scale. Those peaks, um, um, like uh, two to four hundredths of a second, you'll spike up, and then, and then. Say four hundredths of a second, or, or eight hundredths of a second later, you'll be you'll be negative g. So you don't actually have to um, you don't actually have to design for that instantane almost instantaneous um, um, variation in the uh, in the forces which the accelerometers uh, seismographs um, record. You, you don't need to no, actually no. No building is is even designed to to cope with those. So they um, the building's really feeling sort of an averaged out over a longer time frame acceleration, which is less than those. But that was would have been certainly um, something to feel if you'd been um, been there. Yeah. Yes. Um, um, well, what I've looked at really is, uh, well, what what is the bandwidth frequency bandwidth that the uh, that the electromagnetic bearing has to has to cope with? Um, and so that that determines how quickly the current has to change in the winding to uh, to produce the control force that you require. Um, and so obviously, the higher the bandwidth that you require, the the higher the um, your uh, your converter volt ampere requirements are to be able to achieve that because you need to apply a higher voltage to the uh, to the electromagnet. And so um, so you want the uh, converter volt ampere requirements to be feasible as well. You, you don't want to have to need to use giant uh, converters with uh, really 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 high voltages. So. Um, so as part of the design process, you, 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 you're designing so that, so that that is economic as well. Well, well how, how, do you, how do you maintain your power supply in other yeah. words? Yeah. Um, um, you, you could, you could uh, in theory, um, harvest the energy of the earthquake using some sort of linear generation device. Um, but 
but I, I think that would be expensive in 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 I, in my opinion, I think that would be expensive and, and unreliable. So I think, um, um, and you, obviously you can't rely on the grid. Um, so really I think that the best solution is, is batteries. Um, and, uh, and in particular, um, you know, we've, we've, we've been looking at house size systems, which may be able to use um, batteries in a, uh, in a, um, in a solar PV uh, battery storage system, potentially. So. Um, yeah, though I think if they're reasonably well secured, you, you'd be pretty, you're pretty right. Yeah, yeah, there, there are standards, there are seismic standards for retaining things like that. So I, I don't think that's an issue. If, uh, yeah. Thank you, Richard.